Chapter 12. What I Saw of the Destruction of Weybr Weybridge and Shepperton. As the dawn grew brighter, we withdrew from the window, from which we had watched the Martians, and went very quietly downstairs. The artilleryman agreed with me that the house was no place to stay in. He proposed, he said, to make his way Londonward, and thence rejoin his battery, number 12, of the horse artillery. My plan was to return at once to Leatherhead, and so greatly had the strength of the Martians impressed me, impressed me that I had determined to take my wife to New Haven and go with her out of the country forthwith. For I already perceived clearly that the country about London must inevitably be the scene of a disastrous struggle before such creatures as these could be destroyed. Between us and Leatherhead, however, lay the third cylinder, with its guarding giants. Had I been alone, I think I should have taken my chance and struck across country. But the artillerymen dissuaded me. "'It's no kindness to the right sort of wife,' he said, "'to make her a widow.' And in the end I agreed to go with him, under the cover of the woods, northward as far as Street Cobham, before I parted with him. Thence I would make a big detour by Epsom to reach Leatherhead. I should have started at once, but my companion had been in active service, and he knew better than that. He made me ransack the house for a flask, which he filled with whiskey, and we lined every available pocket with packets of biscuits and slices of meat. Then we crept out of the house and ran as quickly as we could down the ill-made road by which I had come overnight. The houses seemed deserted. In the road lay a group of three charred bodies close together, struck dead by the heat ray and here and there were things that people had dropped, a clock, a slipper, a silver spoon, and the, and the like, poor valuables. At the corner, turning towards the post office, a little cart, filled with boxes and furnitures, and horseless, heeled over on a broken wheel. A cash box had been hastily smashed open and thrown under the debris. Except the lodge of the orphanage, which was still on fire, none of the houses had suffered very greatly here. The heat ray had shaved the chimney tops and passed. Yet, save ourselves, there did not seem to be a living soul on Mayberry Hill. The majority of the inhabitants had escaped, I supposed, by way of the old Woking Road, the road I had taken when I drove to Leatherhead, or they had hidden. We went down the lane by the body of the man in black, sodden now from the overnight hail, and broke into the woods at the foot of the hill. We pushed through these towards the railway without meeting a soul. The woods across the line were but the scarred and blackened ruins of woods. For the most part, the trees had fallen, but a certain proportion still stood, dismal gray stems with dark brown foliage instead of green. On our side, the fire had done no more than scorch the nearer trees. It had failed to secure its footing. In one place, the woodmen had been at work on Saturday. Trees, felled and freshly trimmed, lay in a clearing with heaps of sawdust by the sawing machine and its engine. Hard by was a temporary hut, deserted. There was not a breath of wind this morning, and everything was strangely still. Even the birds were hushed, and as we hurried along, I and the artilleryman talked in whispers and looked now and again over our shoulders. Once or twice we stopped to listen. After a time we drew near the road, and as we did so, we heard the clatter of hoofs and saw through the tree stems three cavalry soldiers riding slowly towards Woking. We hailed them, and they halted while we hurried towards them. It was a lieutenant and a couple of privates of the Eighth, Hus Eighth Hussars, with a stand like a theodolite, which the artilleryman told me was a heliograph. "'You are the first men I've seen coming this way this morning,' said the lieutenant. "'What's brewing?' His voice and face were eager. The men behind him stared curiously. The artilleryman jumped down the bank into the road and saluted. "'Gun destroyed last night, sir. Have been hiding, trying to rejoin Battery, sir. You'll come in sight of the Martians, I expect, about half a mile along this road.' "'What the diggins are they like?' asked the lieutenant. 
Giants in armor, sir, hundred feet high. Three legs and a body like aluminum with a mighty great head and a hood, sir. Get out, said the lieutenant. What confounded nonsense. You'll see, sir. They carry a kind of box, sir, that shoots fire and strikes you dead. What do you mean, a gun? No, sir. And the artilleryman began a vivid account of the heat ray. Halfway through, the lieutenant interrupted him and looked up at me. I was still standing on the bank by the side of the road. It's perfectly true, I said. Well, said the lieutenant, I suppose it's my business to see it too. Look here. To the artilleryman, we're detailed here clearing people out of their houses. You'd better go along and report yourself to Brigadier General Marvin and tell him all you know. He's at Weybridge. Know the way? I do, I said, as he turned his horse southward again. Half a mile, you say? said he. At most, I answered, and pointed over the treetops southward. He thanked me and rode on, and we saw them no more. Farther along the road, we came upon a group of three women and two children in the road, busy clearing out a laborer's cottage. They had got a hold of a little hand truck and were piling it up with unclean-looking bundles and shabby furniture. They were all too assiduously engaged to talk to us as we passed by. By Byfleet Station, we emerged from the pine trees and found the country calm and peaceful under the morning sunlight. We were far beyond the range of the heat ray there, and had it not been for the silent desertion of some of the houses, the stirring movement of packing in others, and the knot of soldiers standing on the bridge over the railway, and staring down the line towards Woking, the day would have seemed very like any other Sunday. Several farm wagons and carts were moving creakily along the road to Addlestone, and suddenly, through the gate of a field we saw, across a stretch of flat meadow, six twelve-pounders, standing neatly at equal distances, pointing towards Woking. The gunners stood by the guns, waiting, and the ammunition wagons were at a business-like distance. The men stood almost as if under inspection. "'That's good,' said I. "'They will get one fair shot, at any rate.' The artilleryman hesitated at the gate. "'I shall go on,' he said. Farther on, towards Raybridge, just over the bridge, there were a number of men in white fatigue jackets, throwing up a long rampart and more guns behind. "'It's bows and arrows against any against the lightning, anyhow,' said the artilleryman. "'They haven't seen that fire beam yet. The officers, who were not actively engaged, stood and stared over the treetops southwestward, and the men, digging, would stop every now and again to stare in the same direction. Byfleet was in a tumult, people packing and a score of hussars, some of them dismounted, some on horseback, were hunting them about. Three or four black government wagons with crosses in white circles and an old omnibus, among other vehicles, were being loaded in the village street. There were scores of people, most of them sufficiently sabbatical to have assumed their best clothes. The soldiers were having the greatest difficulty in making them realize the gravity of their position. We saw one shriveled old fellow with a huge box and a score or more of flower pots containing orchids, angrily expostulating with the corporal who would leave them behind. I stopped and gripped his arm. Do you know what's over there? I said, pointing at the pine tops that hid the Martians. Eh? said he, turning. I was explaining these is vi valuable. Death, I shouted. Death is coming. Death. And leaving him to digest that if he could, I hurried on after the artilleryman. At the corner I looked back. The soldier had left him, and he was still standing by his box, with the pots of orchids on the lid of it, and was staring vaguely over the trees. No one in Weybridge could tell us where the headquarters was, were established. The whole place was in such confusion as I had never seen in any town before. Carts, carriages everywhere, the most astonishing miscellany of conveyances and horse flesh. The respectable inhabitants of the place, men in golf and boating costumes, wives prettily dressed, were packing, riverside loafers energetically helping, children excited and, for the most part, highly delighted at this astonishing variation of their Sunday experiences. In the midst of it all, the worthy vicar was very pluckily holding an early celebration, and his bell was jangling out above the excitement. I and the artilleryman 
seated on the step of the drinking fountain, made a very passable meal upon we, what we had brought with us. Patrols of soldiers, here no longer hussars, but grenadiers in white, were warning people to move now or to take refuge in their cellars as soon as the firing began. We saw as we crossed the railway bridge that a growing crowd of people had assembled in and about the railway station, and the swarming platform was piled with boxes and packages. Ordinary traffic had been stopped, I believe, in order to allow of the passage of troops and guns to Chertsey, and I have heard since that a savage struggle occur occurred for places in the special trains that were put on at a later hour. We remained at Weybridge until midday, and at that hour we found ourselves at the place near Shepperton Lock, where the Way and Thames join. Part of the time we spent helping two old women to pack a little cart. The Way has a treble mouth, and at this point boats are to be hired, and there was a ferry across the river. On the Shepperton side was an inn with a lawn, and beside that, the tower of Shepperton Church. It has been replaced by a spire, rose above the trees. Here we found an exciting, excited and noisy crowd of fugitives. As yet, the flight had not grown to a panic, but there were already far more people than all the boats going to and fro could enable to cross. People came panting along under heavy burdens. One husband and wife were even carrying a small outhouse door between them, with some of their household goods, household goods piled thereon. One man told us he meant to try to get away from Shepherdon Station. There was a lot of shouting, and one man was even jesting. The idea people seemed to have here was that the Martians were simply formidable human beings who might attack and sack the town, to be certainly destroyed in the end. Every now and then, people would glance nervously across the way, at the meadows towards Chertsey, but everything over there was still. Across the Thames, except just where the boats landed, everything was quiet, in vivid contrast with the Surrey side. The people who landed there from the boats went tramping off down the lane. The big ferry boat had just made a journey. Three or four soldiers stood on the lawn of the inn, staring and jesting at the fugitives, without offering to help. The inn was closed, as it was now within prohibited hours. "'What's that?' cried a boatman, and, "'Shut up, you fool!' said a man near, to me, near me to a yelping dog. Then the sound came again, this time from the direction of Chertsey. A muffled thud, the sound of a gun. The fighting was beginning— Almost immediately, unseen batteries across the river, to our right unseen because of the trees, took up the chorus, firing heavily one after the other. A woman screamed. Every everyone stood arrested by the sudden stir of battle, near us and yet invisible to us. Nothing was to be seen save flat meadows, cows feeding unconcernedly for the most part, and silvery pollard willows motionless in the sunlight, in the warm sunlight. The soldiers will stop him, said a man beside me, doubtfully. A, a hazy, haziness rose over the treetops. Then, suddenly, we saw a rush of smoke far away up the river, a puff of smoke that jerked up into the air and hung, and forthwith the ground heaved underfoot, and a heavy explosion shook the air, smashing two or three windows in the houses near and leaving us astonished. Here they are, shouted a man in blue jersey. Yonder! Do you see them? Yonder! Quickly, one after the other, one, two, three, four of the armored Martians appeared, far away over the little trees across the flat meadows that stretched out towards Chertsey, and striding hurriedly towards the little river. Little cowled figures, they seemed at first, going with a rolling motion as, and as fast as flying birds. Then, advancing obliquely towards us, came a fifth, their armored bodies glittered in the sun as they swept swiftly forward upon the guns, growing ra rapidly larger as they drew nearer. One on the extreme left, the remotest that is, flourished a huge case high in the air, and the ghostly, terrible heat ray I had already seen on Friday night smote towards Chertsey and struck the town. At sight of these strange, swift, and terrible creatures, 
The crowd near the water's edge seemed to me to be for a moment horror-struck. There was no screaming or shouting, but silence. Then a hoarse murmur and a movement of feet, a splashing from the water. A man too frightened to drop the portmanteau he carried on his shoulder, swung round and sent me staggering with a blow from the corner of his burden. A woman thrust at me with her hand and rushed past me. I turned with the rush of people, but I was not too terrified for thought. The terrible heat ray was in my mind. To get under water, that was it. Get under water, I shouted, unheeded. I faced about again and rushed towards the approaching Martian, rushed right down the gravelly beach and headlong into the water. Others did the same. A boatload of people putting back came leaping out as I rushed past. The stones under my feet were muddy and slippery, and the river was so low that I ran perhaps twenty feet, scarcely waist-deep. Then, as the Martian towered overhead, scarcely a couple of hundred yards away, I flung myself forward under the surface. The splashes of the people in the boats leaping into the river sounded like thunderclaps in my ears. People were landing hastily on both sides of the river. But the Martian machine took no more notice for the moment of the people running this way and that than a man would of the confusion of ants in a nest against which his foot has kicked. When, half suffocated, I raised my head above water, the Martian's hood pointed at the batteries that were still firing across the river and as it advanced it swung loose what must have been the generator of the heat ray. In another moment it was on the bank and in a stride wading halfway across. The knees of its foremost legs bent at the farther bank and in another moment it had raised itself up to its full height again, close to the village of Shepperton. Forthwith the six guns, which, unknown to anyone on the right bank, had been hidden behind the outskirts of that village, fired simultaneously. The sudden near concussion, the last close upon the first, last close upon the first, made my heart jump. The monster was already raising the case generating the heat ray as the first shell burst six yards above the hood. I gave a cry of astonishment. I saw and thought nothing of the other four Martian monsters. My attention was riveted upon the nearer incident. Simultaneously, two other shells burst in the air near the body as the hood twisted round in time to receive, but not in time to dodge the fourth shell. The shell burst clean in the face of the thing. The hood bulged, flashed, was whirled off in a dozen tattered fragments of red, flesh, and glittering metal. Hit! shouted I with something between a scream and a cheer. I heard answering shouts from the people in the water about me. I could have leapt out of the water with that momentary exultation. The decapitated colossus reeled like a drunken giant, but it did not fall over. It recovered its balance by a miracle, and no longer heeding its steps, and with the camera that fired the heat ray, now rigidly upheld, it reeled swiftly upon Shepperton. The living intelligence, the Martian within the hood, was slain and splashed to the four winds of heaven, and the thing was now but a mere intricate device of metal whirling to destruction. It drove along in a straight line, incapable of guidance. It struck the tower of Shepperton Church, smashing it down as the impact of a battering ram might have done, swerved aside, blundered on, and collapsed with tremendous force into the river out of my sight. A violent explosion shook the air, and a spout of water, steam, mud, and shattered metal shot far up into the sky. As the camera of the heat ray hit the water, the latter had immediately flashed into steam. In another moment, a huge wave, like a muddy tidal, bore, but almost scaldingly hot, came sweeping round the bend upstream. I saw people struggling shorewards and heard their screaming and shouting, faintly above the seething roar of the Martian's collapse. For a moment, I heeded nothing of the heat, forgot the patent need of self-preservation. I splashed through the tumultuous water, pushing aside a man in black to do so, until I could see round the bend. Half a dozen deserted boats pitched aimlessly upon the confusion of the waves. The fallen Martian came into sight downstream, lying across the river, and for the most part submerged. Thick clouds of steam were pouring off the wreckage, and through the tumultuously whirling wisps I could see, intermittently and vaguely, the gigantic limbs churning the water and flinging a splash and spray of mud and froth into the air. The tentacles swayed and struck like living arms, 
and save for the helpless purposes, purposelessness of these movements, it was as if some wounded thing were struggling for its life amid the waves. Enormous quantities of a ruddy brown fluid were spurting up in noisy jets out of the machine. My attention was diverted from this death flurry by a furious yelling like that of the thing called a siren in our manufacturing towns. A man, knee-deep near the towing path, shouted inaudibly to me and pointed. Looking back, I saw the other Martians advancing, with gigantic strides down the riverbank from the direction of Chertsey. The Shepperton guns smoke, spoke this time unavailingly. At that, I ducked at once underwater, and, holding my breath until movement was in agony, blundered painfully ahead under the surface as long as I could. The water was in a tumult about me, and rapidly growing hotter. When, for a moment, I raised my head to take breath and throw the hair and water from my eyes, the steam was riling, rising in a whirling white fog that at first hid the Martians altogether. The noise was deafening. Then I saw them dimly, colossal figures of gray, magnified by the mist. They had passed by me, and two were stooping over the frothing, tumultuous ruins of their comrade. The third and fourth stood behind him in the water, one perhaps two hundred yards from me, the other towards Laylam. The generators of the heat rays heat waved high, and the hissing beams smote down this way and that. The air was full of sound, a deafening and confusing con conflict of noises, the clangorous din of the Martians, the crash of falling houses, the thud of trees, fences, sheds flashing into flame, and the crackling roar of fire. Dense black smoke was leaping up to mingle with the steam from the river, and as the heat ray went to who and fro over Weybridge, its impact was marked by flashes of incandescent white that gave place at once to a smoky dance of lurid flames. The nearer houses still stood intact, awaiting their fate, shadowy, faint, and pallid in the steam, with the fire behind them going to and fro. For a moment, perhaps, I stood there, breast high in the almost boiling water, dumbfounded at my position, hopeless of escape. Through the reek I could see the people who had been with me in the river scrambling out of the water through the reeds like little frogs, hurrying through grass from the advance of a man, or running to and fro in utter dismay on the towing path. Then, suddenly, the white flashes of the heat ray came leaping towards me, the houses caved in as they dissolved at its touch and darted out flames. The trees changed to fire with a roar. The, ru the ray flickered up and down the towing path, licking off the people who ran this way and that, and came down to the water's edge not fifty yards from where I stood. It swept across the river to Shepperton, and the water in its track rose in a boiling wheel crested with steam. I turned shoreward. In another moment, the huge wave, well nigh at the boiling point, had rushed upon me. I screamed aloud and scalded, half-blinded, agonized. I staggered through the leaping, hissing water towards the shore. Had my foot stumbled, it would have been the end. I fell helplessly, in full sight of the Martians, upon the, board, upon the broad, bare, gravelly spit that runs down to the, mark the angle of the way and the Thames. I expected nothing but death. I have a dim memory of the foot of a Martian coming down within a score of yards of my head, driving straight into the loose gravel, whirling it this way and that and lifting again, of a long suspense, and then of the four carrying the debris of their comrade between them, now clear and then presently faint through a veil of smoke, receiving, receding interminably, as it seemed to me, across a vast space of river and meadow. And then, very slowly, I realized that by a miracle I had escaped. Chapter 13 How I Fell In With the Curate After getting this sudden lesson in the power of terrestrial weapons, the Martians retreated to their original position upon Horschel Common, and in their haste and encumbered with the debris of their smashed companion, they no doubt overlooked many such a stray and negligible victim as myself. Had they left their comrade and pushed on forthwith, there was nothing at that time between them and London but batteries of twelve-pounder guns, 
and they would certainly have reached the capital in advance of the tidings of their approach. As sudden, dreadful, and destructive their advent would have been as the earthquake that destroyed Lisbon a century ago. But they were in no hurry. Cylinder followed cylinder on its interplanetary flight. Every twenty-four hours brought them reinforcements. And meanwhile, the military and naval authorities, now fully alive to the tremendous power of their antagonists, worked with furious energy. Every minute a fresh gun came into position, until, before twilight, every copse, every row of suburban villas on the hilly slopes about Kingston and Richmond, masked an expectant black muzzle. And through the charred and desolated area, perhaps twenty square miles altogether, that encircled the Martian encampment on Horschel Common, through, though, through charred and ruined villages among the green trees, through the blackened and smoking arcades that had been but a day ago pine spinnies, crawled the devoted scouts with the heliographs that were presently to warn the gunners of the Martian approach. But now the Martians understood our command of artillery and the danger of human proximity, and not a man ventured within a mile of either cylinder, save at the price of his life. It would seem that these giants spent the earlier part of the afternoon in going to and fro, transferring everything from the second and third cylinders, the second in the Adelstone Golf Links and the third at Pierford, to their original pit on Horschel Common. Over that, above the blackened heather and ruined buildings that stretched far and wide, stood one as sentinel, while the rest abandoned their vast fighting machines and descended into the pit. They were hard at work, there far into the night, and the towering pillars of dense green smoke that rose therefrom could be seen from the hills about Marrow, and even, it is said, from Banstead and Epsom Downs. And while the Martians behind me were thus preparing for their next sally, and in front of me humanity gathered for the battle, I made my way with infinite pains and labor from the fire and smoke of burning Weybridge towards London. I saw an abandoned boat, very small and remote, drifting downstream, and throwing off the most of my sodden clothes, I went after it, gained it, and so escaped out of that destruction. There were no oars in the boat, but I contrived to paddle, as well as my parboiled hands would allow, down the river towards Halliford and Walton, going very tediously and continually looking behind me, as you may well understand. I followed the river because I considered that the Water gave me my best chance of escape, should these giants return. The hot water from the Martians' overthrow drifted downstream with me, so that for the best part of a mile I could see little of either bank. Once, however, I made out a string of black figures hurrying across the meadows from the direction of Weybridge. Halliford, it seemed, was deserted, and several of the houses facing the river were on fire. It was strange to see the place quite tranquil, quite desolate under the hot blue sky, with the smoke and little threads of flame going straight up into the heat of the afternoon. Never before had I seen houses burning without the accompaniment of an obstructive crowd. A little farther on, the dry reeds up the bank were smoking and glowing, and a line of fire inland was marching steadily across a late field of hay. For a long time I drifted, so painful and weary was I after the violence I had been through, and so intense the heat upon the water. Then my fears got the better of me again, and I resumed my paddling. The sun scorched my bare back. At last, as the bridge at Walton was coming into sight round the bend, my fever and faintness overcame my fears, and I landed on the Middlesex bank and lay down, deadly sick, amid the long grass. I suppose the time was then about four or five o'clock. I got up presently, walked perhaps half a mile without meeting a soul, and then lay down again in the shadow of a hedge. I seem to remember talking wanderingly to myself during that last spurt. I was also very thirsty and bitterly regretful I had drunk no more water. It is a curious thing that I felt angry with my wife. I cannot account for it, but my impotent desire to reach Leatherhead worried me excessively. I do not clearly remember the arrival of the curate, so that probably I dozed. I became aware of him as a seated figure in soot-smudged 
shirt sleeves and with his upturned, clean-shaven face staring at a faint flickering that danced over the sky. The sky was what is called a mackerel sky, rows and rows of faint down plumes of cloud, just tinted with the midsummer sunset. I sat up, and at the rustle of my motion, he looked at me quickly. Have you any water? I asked abruptly. He shook his head. You have been asking for water for the last hour, he said. For a moment, we were silent, taking stock of each other. I dare say he found me a strange enough figure, naked save for my water-soaked trousers and socks, scalded and my face and shoulders blackened by the smoke. His face was a fair weakness, his chin retreated, and his hair lay in crisp, almost flaxen curls on his low forehead. His eyes were rather large, pale blue, and blankly staring. He spoke abruptly, looking vacantly away from me. "'What does it mean?' he said. "'What do these things mean?' I stared at him and made no answer. He extended a thin white hand and spoke in almost a complaining tone. "'Why are these things permitted? What sins have we done?' The morning service was over. I was walking through the roads to clear my brain for the afternoon, and then fire, earthquake, death. As if it were Sodom and Gomorrah, all our work undone. All the work. What are these Martians? What are we? I answered, clearing my throat. He gripped his knees and turned to look at me again. For half a minute, perhaps, he stared silently. I was walking through the roads to clear my brain, he said, and suddenly... Fire, earthquake, death. He relapsed into silence, with his chin now sunken almost to his knees. Presently, he began waving his hand. All the work, all the Sunday schools, what have we done? What has Weybridge done? Everything gone, everything destroyed. The church, we rebuilt it only three years ago, gone, swept out of existence. Why? Another pause, and he broke out again, like one demented. The smoke of her burning goeth up forever and ever, he shouted. His eyes flamed, and he pointed a lean finger in the direction of Weybridge. By this time, I was beginning to take his measure. The tremendous tragedy in which he had been involved, it was evident that he was a fugitive from Weybridge, had driven him to the very edge of his reason. Are we far from Sunbury? I, I said in a matter-of-fact tone. What are we to do? he asked. Are these creatures everywhere? Has the earth been given over to them? Are we far from Sunbury? Only this morning. I officiated at early celebration. Things have changed, I said quietly. You must keep your head. There is still hope. Hope? Yes, plentiful hope for all this destruction. I began to explain my view of our position. He listened at first, but as I went on, the interest dawning in his eyes gave, gave place to their former stare, and his regard wandered from me. This must be the beginning of the end, he said, interrupting me. The end, the great and terrible day of the Lord, when men shall call upon the mountains and the rocks to fall upon them and hide them, hide them from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne. I began to understand the position I ceased my labored reasoning, struggled to my feet, and, standing over him, laid my hand on his shoulder. "'Be a man,' said I. "'You are scared out of your wits. What good is religion if it collapses under calamity? Think of what earthquakes and floods, wars and volcanoes have done before to men. Did you think God had exempted Weybridge? He is not an insurance agent.' For a time he sat in blank silence. "'But how can we escape?' he asked suddenly." They are invulnerable, they are pitiless. Neither the one, nor, perhaps, the other, I answered. And the, mighty the mightier they are, the more sane and wary should we be. One of them was killed yonder, not three hours ago. Killed, he said, staring about him. How can God's ministers be killed? I saw it happen, I proceeded to tell him. We have chanced to come in for the thick of it, said I, and that is all. "'What is that flicker in the sky?' he asked abruptly. "'I told him it was the heliograph signaling "'that it was the sign of human help and effort in the sky. 
We are in the midst of it, I said, quiet as, that is, quiet as it is. That flicker in the sky tells of the gathering storm. Yonder, I take it, are the Martians, and Londonward, where those hills rise above Richmond and Kingston, and the trees give cover. Earthworks are being thrown up, and guns are being placed. Presently, the Martians will be coming this way again. And even as I spoke, he sprang to his feet and stopped me by a gesture. Listen, he said. From beyond the low hills across the water came the dull resonance of distant guns and a remote weird crying. Then everything was still. A cockchafer came droning over the hedge and passed us. High in the west, the crescent moon hung faint and pale above the smoke of Weybridge and Shepperton and the hot, still splendor of the sunset. We had better follow this path, I said, northward. Chapter 14 In London My younger brother was in London when the Martians fell at Woking. He was a medical student working for an imminent examination, and he heard nothing of the arrival until Saturday morning. The morning papers on Saturday contained, in addition to lengthy special articles on the planet Mars, on life in the planets, and so forth, a brief and vaguely worded telegram, all the more striking for its brevity. The Martians, alarmed by the approach of a crowd, had killed a number of people with a quick-firing gun, so the story ran. The telegram concluded with the words, Formidable as they seem to be, the Martians have not moved from the pit into which they have fallen, and indeed seem incapable of doing so. Probably this is due to the relative strength of the Earth's gravitational energy. On that last text, their leader writer, leader writer expanded very comfortingly. Of course, all the students in the Crammer's biology class to which my brother went that day were intensely interested, but there were no signs of any unusual excitement in the streets. The afternoon papers puffed scraps of news under big headlines. They had nothing to tell beyond the movements of troops about the common and the burning of the pine woods between Woking and Weybridge until eight. Then the St. James Gazette, in an extra special edition, announced the bare fact of the interruption of telegraphic communication. This was thought to be due to the falling of burning pine trees across the line. Nothing more of the fighting was known that night, the night of my drive to Leatherhead and back. My brother felt no anxiety about us, as he knew from the description in the papers that the cylinder was a good two miles from my house. He made up his mind to run down that night to me in order, as he says, to see the things before they were killed. He dispatched a telegram, which never reached me, about four o'clock, and spent the evening at a music hall. In London, also on Saturday night, there was a thunderstorm, and my brother reached Waterloo in a cab. On the platform from which the midnight train usually starts, he learned, after some waiting, that an accident prevented trains from reaching Woking that night. The nature of the accident he could not ascertain. Indeed, the railway authorities did not clearly know at that time. There was very little excitement in the station as the officials, failing to realize that anything further than a breakdown between Byfleet and Woking Junction had occurred, were running the theater trains, which usually passed through Woking, round by Virginia Water to Guild or Guildford. They were busy making the necessary arrangements to alter the route of the Southampton and Portsmouth Sunday League excursions. A nocturnal newspaper reporter, mistaking my brother for the traffic manager, to whom he bears a slight resemblance, waylaid and tried to interview him. Few people, excepting the railway officials, connected the breakdown with the Martians. I have read in another account of these events that on Sunday morning all London was elected for electrified by the news from Woking. As a matter of fact, there was nothing to justify that very extravagant phrase. Plenty of Londoners did not hear of the Martians until the panic of Monday morning. Those who did so, took some time to realize all, all that the hastily worded telegrams in the Sunday papers conveyed. The majority of people in London did not read Sunday papers. The habit of personal security, moreover, is so deeply fixed in the Londoner's, Londoner's mind and startling intelligence, so much a matter of course in the papers, that they could read without any personal tremors. 
About seven o'clock last night, the Martians came out of the cylinder, and, moving about under an armor of metallic shields, have completely wrecked Woking Station with the adjacent houses, and massacred an entire bata br battalion of the Cardigan Regiment. No details are known. Maxims have been absolutely useless against their armor. The field guns have been disabled by them. Flying hussars have been galloping into Chertsey. The Martians appear to be moving slowly towards Chertsey or Windsor. Great anxiety prevails in West Surrey, and earthworks are being thrown up to check the advance Londonward. That was how the Sunday Sun put it, and a clever and remarkably prompt handbook article in the referee compared the affair to a menagerie suddenly let loose in a village. No one in London knew positively of the nature of the armored Martians, and there was still a fixed idea that these monsters must be sluggish, crawling, creeping painfully. Such expressions occurred in almost all the earlier reports. None of the telegrams could have been written by an eyewitness of their advance. The Sunday papers printed separate editions as further news came to hand, some even in default of it, but there was practically nothing more to tell people until late in the afternoon when the authorities gave the press agencies the news in their possession. It was stated that the people of Walton and Weybridge and all the district were pouring along the road Londonward, Londonward, and that was all. My brother went to church at the Foundling Hospital in the morning, still in ignorance of what had happened on the previous night. There he heard allusions made to the invasion and a special prayer for peace. Coming out, he bought a referee. He became alarmed at the news in this and went again to Waterloo Station to find out if communication were restored. The omnibuses, carriages, cyclists, and innumerable people walking in their best clothes seemed scarcely affected by the strange intelligence that the news vendors were disseminating. People were interested, or, if alarmed, alarmed only on account of the local residents. At the station, he heard for the first time that the Windsor and Chertsey lines were now interrupted. The porters told him that several remarkable telegrams had been received in the morning from Byfleet and Chertsey stations, but that these had abruptly ceased. My brother could get very little precise detail out of them. There's fighting going on about Weybridge, was the extent of their information. The train service was now very much disorganized. Quite a number of people who had been expecting friends from places on the southwestern network were standing about the station. One gray-headed old gentleman came and abused the southwestern company bitterly to my brother. It wants showing up, he said. One or two trains came in from Richmond, Putney, and Kingston, containing people who had gone out for a day's boating and found the locks closed and a feeling of panic in the air. A man in a blue and white blazer addressed my brother full of strange tidings. There's hosts of people driving into Kingston in traps and carts and things, with boxes of valuables and all that, he said. They come from Mosley and Weybridge and Walton, and they say there's been guns heard at Chertsey, heavy firing, and that mounted soldiers have told them to get off at once because the Martians are coming. We heard guns firing at Hampton Court Station, but we thought it was thunder. What the dickens does it all mean? The Martians can't get out of their pit, can they? My brother could not tell him. Afterwards, he found that the vague feeling of alarm had spread to the citizens of the Underground Railway, and that the Sunday excursionists began to return from all over southwestern Lung, Barnes, Wimbledon, Richmond Park, Kew, and so forth, at unnaturally early hours, but not a soul had anything more than vague hearsay to tell of. Everyone connected with the terminus some seemed ill-tempered, about five o'clock, the gathering crowd in the station was immensely excited by the opening of the line of communication, which is almost invariably closed between the southeastern and the southwestern stations and the passage, passage of carriage trucks bearing huge guns and brought up and carriages crammed with soldiers. These were the guns that were brought up from Woolwich and Chatham to cover Kingston. There was an exchange of pleasantries. You'll get eaten! We're the beast tamers, and so forth. A little while after that, a squad of police came into the station and began to clear the public off the platforms, and my brother went out into the street again. The church bells were ringing for evensong, and a squad of Salvation Army lassies came singing down Waterloo Road, 
On the bridge, a number of loafers were watching a curious brown scum. They came drifting down the stream in patches. The sun was just setting, and the clock tower and the houses of parliament rose against one of the most peaceful skies it is possible to imagine, a sky of gold, barred with long, transverse stripes of reddish-purple cloud. There was talk of a floating body. One of the men there, a reservist, he said he was, told my brother he had seen the heliograph flickering in the west. In Wellington Street, my brother met a couple of sturdy roughs who had just been rushed out of Fleet Street with still wet newspapers and staring placards. Dreadful catastrophe, they bawled to one to the other down Wellington Street. Fighting at Weybridge, full description, repulse of the Martians, London in danger. He had to give threepence for a copy of that paper. Then it was, and then only, that he realized something of the full power and terror of these monsters. He learned that they were not merely a handful of small, sluggish creatures, but that they were minds swaying vast mechanical bodies, and that they could move swiftly and smite with such power that even the mightiest guns could not stand against them. They were described as vast spider-like machines nearly a hundred feet high, capable of the speed of an express train and able to shoot out a beam of intense heat. Masked batteries, chiefly of field guns, had been planted in the country about Horsell Common, and especially between the Woking District and London. Five of the machines had been seen moving toward the Thames, and one, by a happy chance, had been destroyed. In the other cases, the shells had missed and the batteries had at once been annihilated by the heat rays. Heavy losses of soldiers were mentioned, but the tone of the dispatch was optimistic. The Martians had been repulsed. They were not invulnerable. They had retreated to their triangle of cylinders again in the circle about Woking. Signalers with heliographs were pushing forward upon them from all sides. Guns were in rapid transit, transit from Windsor, Portsmouth, Aldershot, Woolwich, even from the north, among others, long wire guns of 95 tons from Woolwich. Altogether, 116 were in position or being hastily placed, chiefly covering London. Never before in England had there been such a vast or rapid concentration of military material. Any further cylinders that fell, it was hoped, could be destroyed at once by high explosives, which were being rapidly manufactured and distributed. No doubt, ran the report, the situation was of the strangest and gravest description, but the public was exhorted to avoid and discourage panic. No doubt the Martians were strange and terrible in the extreme, but at the outside there could not be more than twenty of them against our millions. The authorities had reason to suppose, from the size of the cylinders, that at the outside there could not be more than five in each cylinder, fifteen altogether, and one at least was disposed of, perhaps more. The public would be fairly warned of the approach of danger, and elaborate measures were being taken for the protection of the people in the threatened southwestern suburbs, and so, with reiterated assurances of the safety of London and the ability of the authorities to cope with the difficulty, this quasi-proclamation closed. This was printed in enormous type on paper so fresh that it was still wet, and there had been no time to add a word of comment. It was curious, my brother said, to see how ruthlessly the usual contents of the paper had been hacked and taken out to give this place. All down Wellington Street, people could be seen fluttering out the pink sheets and reading, and the strand was suddenly noisy with the voices of an army of hawkers following these pioneers. Men came scrambling off buses to secure copies. Certainly this news excited people intensely, whatever their previous apathy. The shutters of a map, map shop in the Strand were being taken down, my brother said, and a man in his Sunday raiment, yellow, lemon-yellow gloves even, was visible inside the window, hastily fastening maps of Surrey to the glass. Going on along the Strand to Trafalgar Square, the paper in his hand, my brother saw some of the fugitives from West Surrey. There was a man with his wife and two boys, and some articles of furniture in a cart, such as a greengrocer uses. He was driving from the direction of Westminster Bridge, and close behind him came a hay wagon with five or six respectable-looking people in it, 
and some boxes and bundles. The faces of these people were haggard, and their entire appearance contrasted conspicuously with the Sabbath best appearance of the people on the omnibuses. People in fashionable clothing peeped at them out of cabs. They stopped at the square as if undecided which way to take, and finally turned eastward along the strand. Some way behind these came a man in workday clothes, riding one of those old-fashioned tricycles with a small wheel on front. He was dirty and white in the face. My brother turned down towards Victoria and met a number of such people. He had a vague idea that he might see something of me. He noticed an unusual number of police regulating the traffic. Some of the refugees were exchanging news with the people on the omnibuses. One was professing to have seen the Martians. Boilers on stilts, I tell you, striding along like men. Most of them were excited and animated by their strange experience. Beyond Victoria, the public houses were doing a lively trade with these arrivals. All the street corner corners, groups of people were reading papers, talking exciting, excitedly, or staring at these unusual Sunday visitors. They seemed to increase as night drew on, until at last the roads, my brother said, were like Epsom High Street on a derby day. My brother addressed several of these fugitives and got unsatisfactory answers from most. None of them could tell him any news of Woking except one man who assured him that Woking had been entirely destroyed on the previous night. I come from Byfleet, he said. Man on a bicycle came through the place in the early morning and ran from door to door, warning us to come away. Then came soldiers. We went out to look, and there were clouds of smoke to the south. Nothing but smoke, and not a soul coming that way. Then we heard the guns at Chertsey and folks coming from Weybridge. So I've locked up my house and come on. At the time, there was a strong feeling in the streets that the authorities were to blame for their incapacity to dispose of the invaders without all this inconvenience. About eight o'clock, a noise of heavy firing was distinctly audible all over the south of London. My brother could not hear it for the traffic in the main thoroughfares, but by striking through the quiet back streets to the river, he was able to distinguish it quite plainly. He walked from Westminster to his apartment near Regent's Park, about two. He was now very anxious on my account, and disturbed at the evident magnitude of the trouble. His mind was inclined to run, even his mind had run on Saturday, on military details. He thought of all those silent, expectant guns of the suddenly nomadic countryside. He tried to imagine boilers on stilts, a hundred feet high. There were one or two cartloads of refugees passing along Oxford Street and several in the Marleybone Road, but so slowly was the news spreading that Regent Street and Portland Place were full of their usual Sunday night promenaders, albeit they talked in groups, and along the edge of Regent's Park there were as many silent couples walking out together under the scattered gas lamps as ever there had been. The night was warm and still and a little oppressive. The sound of guns continued intermittently and after midnight there seemed to be sheet lightning in the south. He read and reread the paper, fearing the worst had happened to me. He was restless, and after summer prowled out again aimlessly. He returned and tried in vain to divert his attention to his examination notes. He went to bed a little after midnight, and was awakened from lurid dreams in the small hours of Monday by the sound of door knockers, feet running in the street, distant drumming, and a clamor of bells. Red reflections danced on the ceiling. For a moment, he lay astonished, wondering whether day had come or the world had gone mad. Then he jumped out of bed and ran to the window. His room was an attic, and as he thrust his head out, up and down the street there were a dozen echoes to the noise of his window sash, and heads in every night, every kind of night, disarray appeared. Inquiries were being shouted, they're coming, bawled a policeman, hammering at the door. The Martians are coming, and hurried to the next door. The sound of drumming and trumpeting came from the Albany Street barracks, and every church within earshot was hard at work, killing sleep with a vehement disorderly toxin. There was a noise of doors opening and window after window, and the houses opposite flashed from darkness and the yellow illumination. Up the street, 
came galloping a closed carriage, bursting abruptly into noise at the corner, rising to a clattering climax under the window, and dying away slowly in the distance. Close on the rear of this came a couple of cabs, the forerunners of a long procession of flying vehicles, going for the most part to Chalk Farm Station, where the Northwestern Special Trains were loading up, instead of coming down the gradient into Euston. For a long time, my brother stared out the window in blank astonishment, watching the policemen hammering at door after door and delivering their incomprehensible message. Then the door behind him opened, and the man who lodged across the landing came in, dressed only in shirt, trousers, and slippers, his braces loose about his waist, his hair disordered from his pillow. "'What the devil is it?' he asked. "'A fire? What the devil of a row?' They both craned their heads out of the window, straining to hear what the policemen were shouting. People were coming out of the side streets and standing in groups at the corners, talking. "'What the devil is it all about?' said my brother's fellow lodger. My brother answered him vaguely and began to dress, running with each garment to the window in order to miss nothing of the growing excitement. And presently, men selling unnaturally early newspapers came bawling into the street. "'London in danger of suffocation! The Kingston and Richmond defenses forced! Fearful massacres in the Thames Valley!' And all about him in the rooms below, in the houses on each side and across the road, and behind in the park terraces and in the hundred other streets of that part of Marleybone, and the Westbourne Park District and the St. Pancras and westward and northward in Kilburn and St. John's Wood and Hampstead, and eastward in Shoreditch and Highbury and Hagerstown and Hoxton, and indeed through all the vastness of London, from Ealing to East Ham, people were rubbing their eyes and opening windows to stare out and ask aimless questions, dressing hastily at the first breath of the coming storm of fear, blew through the streets. It was the dawn of the great panic. London, which had gone to bed early on Sunday night, oblivious and inert, was awakened in the small hours of Monday morning to a vivid sense of danger. Unable from his window to learn what was happening, my brother went down and out into the street, just as the sky between the parapets of the houses grew pink with the early dawn, the flying people on foot and in vehicles grew more numerous every moment. Black smoke, he heard people crying, and again, black smoke. The contagion of such a unanimous fear was inevitable. As my brother hesitated on the doorstep, he saw another news vendor approaching and got a paper forthwith. The man was running away with the rest and selling his paper for a shilling each as he ran it, as he ran a grotesque mingling of profit and panic. And from this paper, my brother read that catastrophic dispatch of the commander-in-chief. The Martians are able to discharge, discharge enormous clouds of a black and poisonous vapor by means of rockets. They have smothered our batteries, destroyed Richmond, Kingston, and Wimbledon, and are advancing slowly towards London, destroying everything on the way. It is impossible to stop them. There is no safety from the black smoke been in instant flight. That was all, but it was enough. The whole population of the great six million city was stirring, slipping, running. Presently it would be pouring en masse northward. Black smoke, the voices cried. Fire! The bells of the neighboring church made a jangling tumult, a cart carelessly driven smashed amid shrieks and curses against the water trough up the street. Sickly yellow lights went to and fro in the houses, and some of the passing cabs flaunted unextinguished lamps, and overhead the dawn was growing brighter, clear and steady and calm. He heard footsteps running to and fro in the rooms and up and down stairs behind him. His landlady came to the door, loosely wrapped in dressing gown and shawl. Her husband followed, ejaculating. As my brother began to realize the import of all these things, he turned hastily to his own room, put all his available money, some ten pounds altogether, into his pockets, and went out again into the streets. Chapter 15. What Happened in Surrey It was while the curate had sat and talked so wildly to me under the hedge in the flat meadows near Halliford, and while my brother was watching the fugitives stream over Westminster Bridge, that the Martians had resumed the offensive so far as one can ascertain from the conflicting accounts that have been put forth, 
The majority of them remained busied with preparations in the horsel pit until nine that night, hurrying on some operation that disengaged huge volumes of green smoke. But three certainly came out about eight o'clock and, advancing slowly and cautiously, made their way through Byfleet and Purford towards Ripley and Weybridge, and so came ex in sight of the expectant batteries against the setting sun. These Martians did not advance in a body, but in a line, each perhaps a mile and a half from his nearest fellow. They communicated with one another by means of siren-like howls, running up and down the scale from one note to another. It was this howling and firing of the guns at Ripley and St. George's Hill that we had heard at Upper, Hall Upper Halliford. The Ripley gunners, unseasoned artillery volunteers, who ought never to have, been, to have been placed in such a position, fired one wild, premature, ineffectual volley and bolted on horse and foot through the, the deserted village, while the Martians without using his heat ray, walked serenely over their guns, stepped generally, gingerly among them, passed in front of them, and so came unexpectedly upon the guns in Plains Hill Park, which he destroyed. The St. George's Hill men, however, were better led or of a better metal. Hidden by a pine wood as they were, they seemed to have been quite unexpected by the Martian nearest to them. They laid their guns as deliberately as if they had been on parade, and fired at about a thousand yards' range. The shells flashed all round him, and he was seen to advance a few paces, stagger, and go down. Everybody yelled together, and the guns were reloaded in frantic haste. The overthrown Martian set up a prolonged ululation, and immediately a second glittering giant answering him appeared over the trees to the south. It would seem that a leg of the tripod had been smashed by one of the shells. The whole of the second volley flew wide of the Martian on the ground, and simultaneously both his companions brought their heat rays to bear on the battery. The ammunition blew up, the pine trees all about the guns flashed into fire, and only one or two of the men who were already running over the crest of the hill escaped. After this it would seem that the three took counsel together and halted, and the scouts who were watching them report that they remained absolutely stationary for the next half hour. The Martian, who had been overthrown, crawled tediously out of his hood, a small brown figure, oddly suggestive from that distance, of a speck of blight, and apparently engaged in the repair of his support. About nine he had finished, for his cowl was then seen above the trees again. It was a few minutes past nine that night when these three sentinels were joined by four other Martians, each carrying a thick black tube. A similar tube was handed to each of the three, and the seven proceeded to distribute themselves at equal distances along a curved line between St. George's Hill, Weybridge, and the village of Sen, southwest of Ripley. A dozen rockets sprang out of the hills, before them so soon as they began to move and warned the waiting batteries about Ditton and Escher. At the same time, four of their fighting machines, similarly armed with tubes, crossed the river, and two of them, black against the western sky, came into sight of myself and the curate as well, as we hurried warily and painfully along the road that runs northward out of Halliford. They moved, as it seemed to us, upon a cloud, for a milky mist covered the fields and rose to a third of their height. At this sight, the curate cried faintly in his throat and began running, but I knew it was no good running from a Martian, and I turned aside and crawled through dewy nettles and brambles into a, the broad ditch by the side of the road. He looked back, saw what I was doing, and turned to join me. The two halted, the nearer to us, standing and facing Sunbury. The, remoting, the remoter being a gray indistinctness towards the even star, away towards stains. The occasional howling of the Martians had ceased. They took up their positions in the huge crescent about their cylinders in absolute silence. It was a crescent with twelve miles between, it, between its horns. Never since the devising of gunpowder was the beginning of a battle so still. 
to us and to an observer about Ripley, it would have had precisely the same effect. The Martians seemed in solitary possession of the darkling night, lit only as it was by the slender moon, the stars, the afterglow of the daylight, and the ruddy glare from St. George's Hill in the woods of Plainsville. But facing that crescent everywhere, at Staines, Hounslow, Ditton, Escher, Ockham, behind hills and woods south of the river, and across the flat grass meadows to the north of it, wherever a cluster of trees or village houses gave sufficient cover, the guns were waiting. The signal rockets burst and rained their sparks through the night, and vanished, and the spirits of all those watching batteries rose to a tense expectation. The Martians had but to advance into the line of fire, and instantly those motionless black forms of men, those guns glittering so darkly in the early night, would explode into a thunderous fury of battle. No doubt the thought that was uppermost in a thousand of those vigilant minds, even as it was uppermost in mine, was the riddle. How much they understood of us. Did they grasp that we and our millions were organized, disciplined, working together? Or did they interpret our spurts of fire, the sudden stinging of our shells, our steady investment of their encampment, as we should, should the furious unanimity of onslaught in a disturbed hive of bees? Did they dream they might exterminate us? At that time, no one knew what food they needed. A hundred such questions struggled together in my mind as I watched that vast sentinel shape. And in the back of my mind was the sense of all the huge unknown and hidden forces Londonward. Had they prepared pitfalls? Were the powder mills at Hunslow ready as a snare? Would the Londoners have the heart and courage to make a greater Moscow of their mighty, mighty province of houses? Then, after an interminable time, as it seemed to us, crouching and peering through the hedge, came a sound like a distant concussion of a gun. Another nearer, and then another. And then the Martian beside us raised his tube on high and discharged it, gun-wise, with a heavy report that made the ground heave. One towards Staines answered him. There was no flash, no smoke, simply that loaded de detonation. I was so excited by these heavy minute guns following one another that I so far forgot my personal safety and my scalded hands as to clamber up into the hedge and stare towards Sunbury. As I did so, a second report followed, and a big projectile hurled over heads toward Hounslow. I expected at least to see smoke or fire or some such evidence of its work, of its work but all I saw was the deep blue sky above, with one solitary star, and the white mist spreading wide and blue, low beneath, and there had been no crash, no answering explosion. The silence was restored. The minute lengthened to three. "'What has happened?' said the curate, standing up beside me. "'Heaven knows,' said I. A bat flickered by and vanished. A distant tumult of shouting began and ceased. I looked again at the Martian and saw he was now moving eastward along the river bank with a swift, rolling motion. Every moment I expected the fire of some hidden battery to spring upon him, but the evening was calm and unbroken. The figure of the Martian grew smaller as he receded, and presently the mist and the gathering night had swallowed him up. By a common impulse we clambered higher. Towards Sunbury was a dark appearance, as though a conical hill had suddenly come into being there, hiding our view of the farther country, and then, remoter across the river, over Walton, we saw another such summit. These hill-like forms grew lower and broader, broader even as we stared. Moved by a sudden thought, I looked northward, and there I perceived a third of these cloudy, black copjes had, ridden, had risen. Everything had suddenly become very still. Far away to the southeast, marking the quiet, we heard the Mar Martians hooting to one another, and then the air quivered again with the distant thud of their guns, but the earthly artillery made no reply. Now at the time we could not understand these things, but later I was to learn the meaning of these ominous copjes that gathered in the twilight. 
each of the Martians, standing in the great crescent I have described, had discharged, by means of the gun-like tube he carried, a huge canister over whatever hill, copse, cluster of houses, or other possible cover for guns chanced to be in front of him. Some fired only one of these, some two, and in the case, as in the case of the one we had seen, the one at Ripley is said to have discharged no fewer than five at that time. These canisters smashed on striking the ground, they did not explode, and incontinently disengaged an enormous volume of heavy, inky vapor, coiling and pouring upward in a huge and ebony cumulus cloud, a gaseous hill that sank and spread itself slowly over the surrounding country. And the touch of that vapor, the inhaling of its pungent wisps, was death to all that breathes. It was heavy, this vapor, heavier than the densest smoke, so that after the first tumultuous uprush and outflow of its impact, it sank down through the air and poured over the ground in a manner rather liquid than gaseous, abandoning the hills and streaming into the valleys and ditches and watercourses, even as I have heard the carbonic acid gas that pours from volcanic clefts is wont to do, and where it came upon water some chemical action occurred, and the surface would be instantly covered with a powdery scum that sank slowly and made way for more. The scum was absolutely insoluble, and it is a strange thing, seeing the instant effect of the gas, that one could drink without hurt the water from which it had been strained. The vapor did not diffuse as a true gas would do. It hung together in banks, flowing sluggishly down the slope of the land, and driving re reluctantly before the wind, and very slowly it combined with the mist and moisture of the air, and sank to the earth in the form of dust, save that an unknown element giving, giving a group of four lines in the blue of the spectrum is concerned, we are still entirely ignorant of the nature of this sub substance. Once the tumultuous upheel of its dispersion was over, the black smoke clung so closely to the ground, even before its precipitation, that fifty feet up in the air, on the roofs and upper stories of high houses and on great trees, there was a chance of escaping its poison altogether, as was proved even that night at Street Cobham and didn't, didn't. The man who escaped at the former place tells a wonderful story of the strangeness of its coiling flow and how he looked down from the church spire and saw the houses of the village rising like ghosts out of its inky nothingness. For a day and a half he remained there, weary, starving, and sun-scorched, the earth under the blue sky and against the prospect of the distant hills, a velvet-black expanse, with red roofs, green trees, and later black-veiled shrubs and gates, barns, outhouses and walls, rising here and there into the sunlight. But that was at Street Cobham, where the black vapor was allowed to remain until it sank of its own accord into the ground. As a rule, the Martians, when it had served its purpose, cleared the air of it again by wading into it and directing a jet of steam upon it. This they did with the vapor banks near us, as we saw in the starlight from the window of a deserted house at Upper Halliford, whither we had returned. From there we could see the searchlights on Richmond Hill and Kingston Hill going to and fro, and about eleven the windows rattled and we heard the sound of the huge siege guns that had been put in position there. These continued intermittently for the space of a quarter of an hour, sending chance shots at the invisible Martians at Hampton and Ditton, and then the pale beams of the electric light vanished and were replaced by a bright red glow. Then the fourth cylinder fell, a brilliant green meteor, as I learned afterwards in Bushy Park. Before the guns on the Richmond and Kingston line of hills began, there was a fitful cannonade far away in the southwest, due, I believe, to guns being fired haphazard before the black vapor could overwhelm the gunners. So, setting about it as methodically as man might, man might smoke out a wasp's nest, the Martians spread this strange, stifling vapor over the Londonward country. The horns of the crescent slowly moved apart, until at last they formed a line from Hanwell to Coombe and Malden. All night through their destructive tubes, 
advanced. Never once, after the Martian at St. George's Hill was brought down, did they give the artillery uh, the ghost of a chance against them. Wherever there was a possibility of guns being laid for them unseen, a fresh canister of the black vapor was discharged, and where the guns were openly displayed, the heat ray was brought to bear. By midnight, the blazing trees along the slopes of Richmond Park and the glare of Kingston Hill threw their light upon a network of black smoke, blotting out the whole valley of the Thames and extending as far as the eye could reach. And through this, two Martians slowly waded and turned their hissing steam jets this way and that. They were sparing the heat ray that night, either because they had but a limited supply of material for its production, or because they did not wish to destroy the country, but only to crush and overawe the opposition they had aroused. In the latter aim, they certainly succeeded. Sunday night was the end of the organized opposition to their movements. After that, no body of man, men would stand against them, so hopeless was the enterprise. Even the crews of the torpedo boats and destroyers that had brought their quick firers up the Thames refused to stop, mutinied, and went down again. The only offensive operation men ventured upon after that night was the preparation of mines and pitfalls, and even in that, their energies were frantic and spasmodic. One has to imagine, as well as one may, the fate of those batteries towards Escher, waiting so tensely in the twilight. Survivors there were none. One may picture the orderly expectation, the officers alert and watchful, the gunners ready, the ammunition piled to hand, the limber gunners with their horses and wagons, the groups of civilian spectators, standing as near as they were permitted, the evening stillness, the ambulances and hospital tents with the burned and wounded from Weybridge, then the dull resonance of the shots the Martians fired, and the clumsy projectile whirling over the trees and houses and smashing amid the neighboring fields. One may picture, too, the sudden shifting of the attention the swiftly spreading coils and bellyings of that blackness advancing headlong, towering heavenward, turning the twilight to a palpable darkness, a strange and horrible antagonist of vapor, striding upon its victims, men and horses near it, seen dimly running, shrieking, falling headlong, shouts of dismay, the guns suddenly abandoned, men choking and writhing on the ground, and the swift broadening out of the opaque, opaque cone of smoke. And then, night and extinction, nothing but a silent mass of impenetrable, impenetrable vapor hiding its dead. Before dawn, the black vapor was pouring through the streets of Richmond, and the disintegrating organism of government was, with a last expiring effort, rousing the population of London to the necess necessity of flight, Chapter 16. The Exodus from London So you understand the roaring wave of fear that swept through the greatest city in the world, just as Monday was dawning, the stream of flight rising swiftly to a torrent, lashing in a foaming tumult round the railway stations, banked up into a horrible struggle about the shipping in the Thames, and hurrying by every available channel northward and eastward. By ten o'clock, the police organization, and by midway, even the railway organizations, were losing coherency, losing shape and efficiency, guttering, softening, running at last in that swift liquefaction of the social body. All the railway lines north of the Thames and the southeastern people at Cannon Street had been warned by midday on Sunday, and trains were being filled People were fighting savagely for standing room in the carriages, even at two o'clock. By three, people were being trampled and crushed, even in Bishopsgate Street, a couple of hundred yards or more from Liverpool Street Station. Revolvers were fired, people stabbed, and the policemen, who had been sent to direct the traffic, exhausted and infuriated, were breaking the heads of the people they were called out to protect. And as the day advanced and the engine drivers and stokers refused to return to London, the pressure of the flight drove the people in an ever-thickening multitude away from the stations and along the northward running roads. By, by midday, a Martian had been seen at Barnes, 
and a cloud of slowly sinking black vapor drove along the Thames and across the flats of Lambeth, cutting off all escape over the bridges in its sluggish advance. Another bank drove over Ealing and surrounded a little island of survivors on Castle Hill, alive but unable to escape. After a fruitless struggle to get aboard a northwestern train at Chalk Farm, the engines of the trains that had loaded in the goods yard were plowed through shrieking people. They are plowed through shrieking people, and a dozen stalwart men fought to keep the crowd from crushing the driver against his furnace. My brother emerged upon the Chalk Farm road, dodged across through a hurrying swarm of vehicles, and had the luck to be foremost in the sack of a cycle shop. The front tire of the machine he got was punctured in dragging it through the window, but he got up and off notwithstanding, with no further injury than a cut wrist. The steep foot of Haverstock Hill was impassable owing to several overturn, overturned horses, and my brother struck into Belsize Road. So he got out of the fury of the panic and, skirting the Edgware Road, reached Edgware about seven, fasting and wearied, but well ahead of the crowd. Along the road, people were standing in the roadway, curious, wondering. He had passed by a number of cyclists, some horsemen, and two motor cars. A mile from Edgware, the rim of the wheel broke, and the machine became unrideable. He left it by the roadside, roadside and trudged through the village. There were shops half open in the main street of the place, and people crowded on the pavement and in the doorways and windows, staring astonished at this extraordinary procession of fugitives that was beginning. He succeeded in getting some food at the end. For a time, he rem remained in Edgware, not knowing what to do next. The flying people increased in number. Many of them, like my brother, seemed inclined to loiter in the place. There was no fresh news of the invaders from Mars. At that time, the road was crowded but as yet far from congested. Most of the fugitives at that hour were mounted on cycles, but there were soon motor cars, hansom cabs, and carriages hurrying along, and the dust hung in heavy clouds along the road to St. Albans. It was, perhaps, a vague idea of making a, his way to Chelmsford, where some friends of his lived, that at last induced my brother to strike into a quiet lane running eastward. Presently he came upon a stile, and, crossing it, followed a footpath northeastward. He passed near several farmhouses and some little places whose names he did not learn. He saw few fugitives until, in a grass lane towards High Barnet, he happened upon two ladies who became his fellow travelers. He came upon them just in time to save them. He heard their screams, and, hurrying round the corner, saw a couple of men straggling to struggling to drag them out of the little pony chase in which they had been driving, while a third, with difficulty, held the frightened pony's head. One of the ladies, a short woman dressed in white, was simply screaming. The other, a dark, slender figure, slashed at the man who gripped her arm with a whip she held in her disengaged hand. My brother immediately grasped the situation, shouted, and hurried towards the struggle. One of the men desisted and turned towards him, and my brother, realizing from his antagonist's face that a fight was unavoidable and being an expert boxer, went into him forthwith and sent him down against the wheel of his chase. It was no time for a pugilistic chivalry, and my brother laid him quiet with a kick and gripped the collar of the man who pulled at the slender lady's arm. He heard the clatter of hoofs, the whip stung across his face. A third antagonist struck him between the eyes, and the man he held wrenched himself free and made off down the lane in the direction from which he had come. Partly stunned, he found himself facing the man who had held the horse's head and became aware of the chase receding from him down the lane, swaying from side to side, and with it the women in it looking back. The man before him, a burly rough, tried to close, and he stopped him with a blow in the face. Then, realizing that he deserted, he was deserted, he dodged round and made off down the lane after the chase with the sturdy man close behind him and the fugitive who had turned now following remotely. Suddenly, he stumbled and fell. His immediate pursuer went headlong and he rose to his feet to find himself with a couple of antagonists again. 
He would have had little chance against them had not the slender lady very pluckily pulled up and returned to his help. It seems she had had a revolver all this time, but it had been under the seat when she and her companion were attacked. She fired at six yards' distance, narrowly missing my brother. The less courageous of the robbers made off, and his companion followed him, cursing his cowardice. They both stopped in sight down the lane, where the third man lay insensible. Take this, said the slender lady, and she gave my brother her revolver. Go back to the chaise, said my brother, wiping blood from his split lip. She turned without a word. They were both panting, and when they went back to where the lady in white struggled to hold back the frightened pony. The robbers had evidently had enough of it. When my brother looked again, they were retreating. I'll sit here, said my brother, if I may, and he got upon the empty front seat. The lady looked over her shoulder. Give me the reins, she said, and laid the whip along the pony's side. In another moment, a bend in the road hid the three men from my brother's eyes. So, quite unexpectedly, my brother found himself, panting with a cut mouth, a bruised jaw, and blood-stained knuckles, driving along an unknown lane with these two women. He learned they were the wife and younger sister of a surgeon living at Stanmore, who had come in the small hours from a dangerous case at Penner, and heard at some railway station on his way of the Martian advance. He had hurried home, roused the women their servant had left them two days before, packed some provisions, put his revolver under the seat, luckily for my brother, and told them to drive to Edgware, with the idea of getting a train there. He stopped behind to tell the neighbors he would overtake them, he said, at about half past four in the morning, and now it was nearly nine and they had seen nothing of him. They could not stop in Edgware because of the growing traffic through the place, and so they had come into this side lane. That was the story they told my brother in fragments when presently they stopped again, nearer to New Barnet. He promised to stay with them, at least until they could determine what to do, or until the missing man arrived, and professed to be an expert shot with the revolver, a weapon strange to him, in order to give them confidence. The maid, they made a sort of encampment by the wayside, and the pony became happy in the hedge. He told them of his own escape out of London and all that he knew of these Martians and their ways. The sun crept higher in the sky, and after a time their talk died out and gave place to an uneasy state of anticipation. Several wayfarers came along the lane, and of these my brother gathered such news as he could. Every broken answer he had deepened his impression of the great disaster that had come on humanity deepened his persuasion of the immediate necessity for prosecuting this flight, he urged the matter upon them. "'We have money,' said the slender woman, and hesitated. Her eyes met my brother's, and her hesitation ended. "'So have I,' said my brother. She explained that they had as much as thirty pounds in gold besides a five-pound note, and suggested that with that they might get upon a train at St. Albans or New Barnet. My brother thought that was hopeless, seeing the fury of the Londoners to crowd upon the trains and broached his own idea of striking across Essex toward Harwich and thence escaping from the country altogether. Mrs. Elphinstone, that was the name of the woman in white, would listen to no reasoning and kept calling upon George, but her sister-in-law was astonishingly quiet and deliberate, and at last agreed to my brother's suggestion. So, designing to cross the Great North Road, they went on towards Barnet, my brother leading the pony to save it as much as possible. As the sun crept up the sky, the day became excessively hot, and under a foot, underfoot a thick, whitish sand grew burning and blinding, so they traveled only very slowly. The hedges were gray with dust, and as they advanced towards Barnet, a tumultuous murmuring grew stronger. They began to meet more people. For the most part, these were staring before them, murmuring indistinct questions, jaded, haggard, unclean. One man, in evening dress, passed them on foot, his eyes on the ground. They heard his voice and, looking back at him, saw one hand clutched in his hair and the other beating invisible things. His paroxysm of rage over, he went on about his way without once looking back. 
As my brother's party went on towards the crossroads to the south of Barnet, they saw a woman approaching the road across some fields on their left, carrying a child and with two other children, and then passed a man in dirty black, with a thick stick in one hand and a small portmanteau in the other. Then, round the corner of the lane, from between the villas that guarded it at its confluence with the high road, came a little cart drawn by a sweating black pony and driven by a sallow youth in a boulder hat, gray with dust. There were three girls, East End factory girls, and a couple of little children crowded in the cart. This'll take us round Odgewar, asked the driver, wild-eyed, white-faced, and when my brother told him it would, if he turned to the left, he whipped up at once without the formality of thanks. My brother noticed a pale gray smoke or haze rising among the houses in front of them and veiling the white facade of a terrace beyond the road that appeared between the backs of the villas. Mrs. Elphinstone cried suddenly out at a number of tongues of smoky red flame leaping up from the houses in front of them against the hot blue sky. The tumultuous noise resolved itself now into the disorderly mingling of many voices, the gride of many wheels, the creaking of wagons, and the staccato of hooves. The lane came round sharply, not fifty yards from the crossroads. "'Good heavens!' cried Mrs. Elphinstone. "'What is this you are driving us into?' My brother stopped. For the main road was a boiling stream of people, a torrent of human beings rushing northward, one pressing on another. A great bank of dust, white and luminous in the blaze of the sun, made everything within twenty feet of the ground gray and indistinct, and was perpetually renewed by the hurrying feet of a dense crowd of horses and of men and women on foot, and by the wheels of vehicles of every description. Way! my brother heard voices crying. Make way! It was like riding into the smoke of a fire to approach the meeting point of the lane and road. The crowd roared like a fire, and the dust was hot and pungent, and, indeed, a little way up the road, a villa was burning and sending rolling masses of black smoke across the road to add to the confusion. Two men came past them, then a dirty woman carrying a heavy bundle and weeping. A lost retriever dog with hanging tongue circled dubiously round them, scared and wretched, and fled at my brother's threat. So much as they could see of the road Londonward between the houses to the right was a tumultuous stream of dirty, hurrying people pent in between the villas on either side. The black heads, the crowded forms, grew into distinctness as they rushed towards the corner, hurried past, and merged their individuality again in a receding multitude that was swallowed up at last in a cloud of dust. "'Go on! Go on!' cried the voices. "'Way! Way!' One man's hands pressed on the back of another. My brother stood at the pony's head. Irresistibly attracted, he advanced slowly, pace by pace, down the lane. Edgware had been a scene of confusion. Chalk Farm, a riotous tumult. But this was a whole population in movement. It is hard to imagine that host. It had no character of its own. The figures poured out past the corner and receded with their backs to the group in the lane. Along the margin came those who were on foot, threatened by the wheels, stumbling in the ditches, blundering into one another. The carts and carriages crowded close upon one another, making little way for those swifter and more impatient vehicles that darted forward every now and then when an opportunity showed itself of doing so, sending the people scattering against the fences and gates of the villas. "'Push on!' was the cry. "'Push on! They're coming!' In one cart stood a blind man in the uniform of the Salvation Army, gesticulating with his crooked fingers and bawling, Eternity! Eternity! His voice was hoarse and very loud, so that my brother could hear him long after he was lost to sight in the dust. Some of the people who crowded in the carts whipped stupidly at their horses and quarreled with other drivers. Some sat motionless, staring at nothing with miserable eyes. Some gnawed their hands with thirst, or lay prostrate in the bottom of, of, bottoms of their conveyances. The horses' bits were covered with foams, their eyes bloodshot. There were cabs, carriages, shop cars, wagons beyond counting, a mail cart, a road cleaner's cart marked Vestry of St. Pancras, 
A huge timber wagon crowded with roughs, a brewer's dray rumbled by with its two near wheels splashed with fresh, fresh blood. Clear the way, cried the voices. Clear the way. Eternity, eternity, came echoing down the road. There were sad, haggard women tramping by, well-dressed with children that cried and stumbled, their dainty clothes smothered in dust, their weary faces smeared with tears. With many of these came men, sometimes helpful, sometimes lowering and savage. Fighting side by side with them pushed some weary street outcast and faded, black rags, wide-eyed, loud-voiced, and foul-mouthed. There were sturdy workmen thrusting their way along, wretched, unkempt men clothed like clerks or shopmen, struggling spasmodically, a wounded soldier, my brother noticed, men dressed in the clothes of railway porters, one wretched creature in a nightshirt with a coat thrown over it. But varied as its composition was, certain, certain things all that host had in common. There were fear and pain on their faces, and fear behind them, a tumult up the road, a quarrel for a place in a wagon sent the whole host of them quickening their pace. Even a man so scared and broken that his knees bent under him was galvanized for a moment into renewed activity. The heat and dust had already been at work upon this multitude. Their skins were dry, their lips black and cracked. They were all thirsty, weary, and footsore. And amid the various cries, one heard disputes, reproaches, groans of weariness and fatigue. The voices of most of them were hoarse and weak. Through it all ran a refrain. Make way! The Martians are coming! Few stopped and came aside from that flood. The lane opened slantingly into the main road with a narrow opening, and had a delusive appearance of coming from the direction of London. Yet a kind of eddy of people drove into its mouth, weaklings elbowed out of the stream, who for the most part rested but a moment before plunging into it again. A little way down the line, with two friends bending over him, a man lay with a bare leg, wrapped about with bloody rags. He was a lucky man to have friends. A little old man with a gray military mustache and a filthy black frock coat limped out and sat be down beside the trap, removed his boot, his sock was blood-stained, shook out a pebble and hobbled on again, and then a little girl of eight or nine, all alone, threw herself under the hedge, close by my brother, weeping. I can't go on. I can't go on. My brother woke from his torpor of astonishment and lifted her up, speaking gently to her, and carried her to Miss Elphinstone. So soon as my brother touched her, she became quite still, as if frightened. Ellen! shrieked a woman in the crowd with tears in her voice. Ellen! And the child suddenly darted away from my brother, crying, Mother! They are coming, said a man on horseback, riding past along the lane. Out of the way there, bawled the coachman, towering high, and my brother saw a closed carriage turning into the lane. The people crushed back on one another to avoid the horse. My brother pushed the pony and chase back into the hedge, and the man drove by and stopped at the turn of the way. It was a carriage with a pole for a pair of horses, but only one was in the traces. My brother saw dimly through the dust that two men lifted out something on a white stretcher and put it gently on the grass beneath the privet hedge. One of the men came running to my brother. Where is there any water? he said. He is dying fast and very thirsty. It is Lord Garrick. Lord Garrick, said my brother. The Chief Justice? The water, he said. There may be a tap, said my brother. In some of the houses we have no water. I dare not leave my people. The man pushed against the crowd towards the gate of the corner house. Go on, said the people, thrusting at him. They are coming. Go on. Then my brother's attention was distracted by a bearded, eagle-faced man lugging a small handbag, which split even as my brother's eyes rested on it and disgorged a mass of sovereigns that seemed to break up into separate coins as it struck the ground. They rolled hither and thither among the struggling feet of men and horses. The man stopped and looked stupidly at the heap, and the shaft of a cab struck his shoulder and sent him reeling. He gave a shriek and dodged back and a cartwheel shaved him narrowly. Way, cried the men all about him. Make way. So soon as the cab had passed, 
He flung himself with both hands open upon the heap of coins and began thrusting handfuls in his pocket. A horse rose close upon him, and in another moment, half rising, he had been borne down under the horse's hooves. Stop! screamed my brother, and pushing a woman out of his way, tried to clutch the bit of the horse. Before he could get to it, he heard a scream under the wheels and saw through the dust the rim passing over the poor wretch's back. The driver of the cart slashed his whip at my brother, who ran round behind the cart. The multitudinous shouting confused his ears. The man was writhing in the dust among his scattered money, unable to rise, for the wheels had broken his back, and his lower limbs lay limp and dead. My brother stood up and yelled at the next driver, and a man on a black horse came to his assistance. "'Get him out of the road,' said he, and clutching the man's collar with his free hand, my brother lugged him sideways, but he still clutched after his money and regarded my brother fiercely, hammering at his arm with a handful of gold. "'Go on! Go on!' shouted angry voices behind. "'Way! Way!' There was a smash as the pole of a carriage crashed into the cart that the man on horseback stopped. My brother looked up, and the man with the gold twisted his head round and bit the wrist that held his collar. There was a concussion, and the black horse came staggering sideways, and the cart horse pushed beside it. A hoof missed my brother's foot by a hair's breadth. The rele he released his grip on the fallen man and jumped back. He saw anger change to terror on the face of the poor wretch on the ground, and in a moment he was hidden, and my brother was borne backward and carried past the entrance of the lane, uh, and had to fart, fight hard in the torrent to recover it. He saw Miss Elphinstone covering her eyes, and a little child, with all a child's want of sympathetic imagination, staring with dilated eyes at a dusty something that lay black and still, ground and crushed under the rolling wheels. Let us go back, he shouted, and began turning the pony round. We cannot cross this hell, he said, and they went back a hundred yards the way they had come, until the fighting crowd was hidden. As they passed the bend in the lane, my brother saw the face of the dying man in the ditch under the privet, deadly white and drawn and shining with perspiration. The two women sat silent, crouching in their seat and shivering. Then, beyond the bend, my brother stopped again. Miss Elphinstone was white and pale, and her sister-in-law sat weeping, too rapid, wretched to even call upon George. My brother was horrified and perplexed. So soon as they had retreated, he realized how urgent and unavoidable it was to attempt this crossing. He turned to Miss Elphinstone, suddenly resolute. We must go that way, he said, and led the pony round again. For the second time that day, this girl proved her quality. To force their way into the torrent of people, my brother plunged into the traffic and held back a cab horse while she drove the pony across its head. A wagon locked wheels for a moment and ripped a long splinter from the chase. In another moment, they were caught and swept forward by the stream. My brother, with the cabman's whip marks red across his face and hands, scrambled into the chase and took the reins from her. Point the revolver at the man behind, he said, giving it to her, if he presses us too hard. No, point it at his horse. Then he began to look out for a chance of edging to the right across the road. But once in this stream, he seemed to lose volition to become part of that dusty route. They swept through Chipping Barnet with the torrent. They were nearly a mile beyond the center of the town before they had fought across to the opposite side of the way. It was din and dif confusion indescribable. But in and beyond the town, the road forks repeatedly, and this, to some extent, relieved the stress. They struck eastward through Hadley, and there, on either side of the road, and at another place farther on, they came upon a great multitude of people drinking at the stream, some fighting to come to the water. And farther on, from a lull near East Barnet, they saw two trains running slowly one after another, without signal or order trains, swarming with people with men even among the coals behind the engines, going northward along the Great Northern Railway. My brother supposes they must have filled outside London, for at that time the furious terror of the people had rendered the certain central termini impossible. Near this place they halted for the rest of the afternoon, 
for the violence of the day had already utterly exhausted all three of them. They began to suffer the beginnings of hunger. The night was cold, and none of them dared to sleep. And in the evening many people came hurrying along the road nearby their stopping place, fleeing from unknown dangers before them, and going in the direction from which my brother had come.